All right, let's continue now. Class number eight in our end time series, which eventually will become a, a video series, DVDs, etc. This is my, this is my practice run, and you get to be the guinea pigs of uh, what I've talked taught for uh, the last five years or so on the end times and what's what's going to happen next. So, class number eight. Let's finish up where we left off. We're still talking about the day of Christ. This is a very busy day. Lots going on. The earthquake. The uh, sun and the moon going dark, the snatching away of the believers, then what? Well, then we go to the judgment seat of Christ. And that's what we're going to study here uh, in class number 8. First up, judgment seat of Christ. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 in your Bibles. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, First and Second Corinthians. Two letters that Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, basically if we die, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan. In other words, in this body we groan. We want to get out of here. We want to get away from this wicked sinful body. Earnest, desiring, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house that is which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought for us wrought us for the self same thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the spirit. Interesting. Earnest is the down payment. When you're going to buy a house, you give them earnest money. Here's a thousand dollars, I'll be back in thirty days and pay it off. If you don't come back in 30 days and pay it off, you lose your earnest money. They get to keep it because they kept the house off the market for 30 days. If God gives us the earnest of the Spirit, which is mentioned again in Ephesians, and then we end up going to hell because we can lose our salvation, as some teach, well, then the Holy Spirit has to go to hell. God's not going to lose his earnest money. He gave us the earnest of the Holy Spirit. 1969, I accepted Christ. He gave me the down payment of the Holy Spirit in me that day right away. He gave me his promise. You have, right now, you have eternal life. So, I, I, I've had eternal life already. I've already started. 46 and a half years. I can't lose my salvation, but I can lose my rewards. Uh, that's what we're going to get into in this section. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. This talks about the earnest of the Holy Spirit. Verse 5. Verse 6. Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore, we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. Why do we labor? Why do we work for the Lord? So that we can be accepted. Well, what does that mean? Look at verse number 10. For, that means because, here's why we're laboring, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. This is not the great throne judgment at the end of time. This is the judgment seat of Christ. We're going to all appear there that every one may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. That's the day you're going to receive the rewards for what you've done in your body since you become a Christian. What have you done? I ask people, what on earth are you doing for heaven's sake? What have you done in your body for the Lord since you've accepted Christ? I know many people, they're just as saved and going to heaven as I am, and they don't do a blooming thing for God their entire life. <clears throat> All they're worried about is who wins the stupid bowl. You know, oh, wow, or some basketball game or football game or knocking a ball into a hole in the dirt, and they all rejoice. Wow. Think about what you're doing with your time. This is all going to burn. Some people are all they're worried about is how pretty their flowers are in their front yard. Well, I'm in favor of pretty flowers. Okay, I like flowers. But for heaven's sake, there's there's more to life than this now. I mean, what on earth are you doing for heaven's sake? Find something of eternal value to do with your life besides watching people play with a ball of any kind, any shape, ball. Just we get bent out of shape over the dumbest things or earning more pictures of George Washington to put in your wallet. Some people, that's, that's all they worry about. And I, I've often said, you know, people that have a lot of money, you know what they want? More money. People that have a big house, you know what they want? A uh, bigger house. People that watch 10 hours of football a week, you know what they want? 
15 hours of football. It, it, it doesn't ever satisfy. We keep thinking it will. Oh, I just, a little more, you know. They asked Henry Ford when he got his first million dollars back in the early 1900s, and that was a lot of money back then. They said, Henry, you got a million dollars. What do you want now? He said, I want another one. It just won't satisfy. So why do we waste our time on things that will not satisfy? We're going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ to receive the things done in the body. What have you done in your body? Let me give you some suggestions. Why don't you go get alone and say, God, let's you and me talk here for a minute. I am your child. I have been saved. What do you want me to do, Father? He equipped everybody with different gifts. He did not give me uh, some gifts that he gave to other people, and he gave me some that he didn't give to other people. That's God's problem. He appoints the gifts out and says, here's your gift. So what is your gift? I think one of my gifts is ability to take complicated subjects and explain it fourth grade level, because that's where I live and operate all the time, about fourth grade level, and I'm enjoying it. I have no intention of graduating. So <clears throat> I think if that's my gift of teaching, I should use the what gift God has given me to teach what he told me, he showed me to teach. He has not given me the gift of cooking. I don't know how and don't want to learn. My wife is so good at it, I'll just let her cook. Call me when dinner is ready uh, and I'll come eat. Uh, he has not given me the gift of color coordination, obviously. I, I wear whatever <laughs> whatever comes to mind. You know, I like these Hawaiian shirts. Somebody gave me five or six of them. <clears throat> so it doesn't matter to me. I had a, I went and spent $29, I, I can't believe this happened, I'm still, I'm not angry about it, but I bought a, what I thought was a dusty rose colored suit coat, and I was so proud of it, $29, bought my own suit coat. My wife threw it away while I was gone. My peach, she said, honey, that's pink. Don't wear a pink, I said, no, honey, it's not pink, it's dusty rose. Well, it's gone, so... And she probably <laughs> rescued me <laughs> on that one, especially in light of what's happening today. But no. So no, my, my gift is not color coordination. I don't care. I don't know what goes with what, and I don't care. No, just put, lay it out. I'll wear it. Okay. But God has given you some gifts. What has he given you? Some people have a gift of making money. I preached at a church in a small town in Illinois, south of Chicago. And I got talking to one of the guys up there in the church, one of the deacons. I said, brother, what do you do for a living? He said, well, God has gifted me with the ability to make money building bridges. He said, I work for the counties all over Illinois. I go build small bridges over creeks and stuff for county roads. Not the interstate bridges, not the big ones, just county roads. I build the bridges. That guy gave, I think he said he gave $4,000 a week to his little church for their mission program. It was a phenomenal number. I remember it was in like, like back then especially. It was 20, 25 years ago. No, 40, 40 years ago. I couldn't believe it. Anyway, <clears throat> maybe that's your gift. Maybe God has gifted you. Now, he didn't give you that gift of making money so that you can get a new car every year. That's not why he gave you that gift. He gave you that gift so you can support some missionaries and some, some ministries trying to do something for God. If that's your gift, then you're, the, you're supposed, to, supposed to supply the gas to run this machine. <clears throat> maybe God has given you the gift of being compassionate with people, and you can go start a ministry at hospitals or something or nursing homes and, and just sit and be compassionate and talk to people and win them to Christ that way. Jude talks about winning some people with fear and winning some people with compassion. There's different ways to win people to the Lord. People respond differently. You can walk up to three people sitting on a park bench. You walk up and you hand each of them $5,000. First one says, well, thank you. Puts it in his pocket. Second one says, oh, thank you, Larry. Oh, I've been praying for this. And they get all emotional about it. People respond differently. You, People are different, and God gave you some kind of gifts, and you're going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ and give an answer for what you did with what he gave you. <clears throat> some he gives ten talents, some he gives five, and some he gives one. I don't know what God gave you. I'm not sure what all he gave me. But I'm trying to use what little I know about to do something for him, and you can do the same. Maybe your gift is working in the technology field of pushing all these buttons and make this stuff happen. Okay, well then why don't you use that gift and make my videotapes go all over the world. I don't know how to do all that, but if you do, I'll do the I'll do the teaching and you do the spreading. Let's work together. Let's get her done. <clears throat> get the job done. But find something. What's your gift? Because you're going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ with me, and God's going to call you up and mention your name and say, here's what I gave you, and here's what you did with it. 
I am nervous about that day a little bit. God has given me some great gifts that I think I haven't completely used for him, and I'm sorry. God gave me uh, certain talents. He didn't give me a lot of talents, but he gave me some. And Okay, Kent, what are you doing with it? Okay, Lord, I'm, uh, I'm sorry. I'm embarrassed. I, I wasted some of it. Okay, verse number, 2 Corinthians 5, verse number 10. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body according that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. And this is the day, this day of Christ, this judgment seat, when we receive the rewards. You're going to get either gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, hay, and stubble. Of course, if you get the wood, hay, and stubble, then this is going to be tried by fire to see what sort it is. God's not going to test your works to see what size they are. He's going to test it to see what sort. What sort of works are you doing? Why do you do what you do? You say, oh, I obey my parents. Okay, why? Uh, because I'll get a spanking if I don't. Well, that's a reason, but that's not a good reason. Why don't you do everything you do because you love the Lord? You know, you could live with a mean husband and do it because you love the Lord. Abigail had to do that with Naboth, or with uh, Nabal, her husband. He was an idiot, a moron. Sometimes you put up with things just because, you know, I, I, I don't really love him, but I love God. So I'm going to, God, I'm going to serve him and be a good wife because I love you. Maybe you've got mean parents, and you could say as a child, hey, Lord, <clears throat> I have a hard time of honoring my father and mother, but you said honor your father and mother, so I'm going to do it because I love you, not because I love them. Maybe you could have a mission field and go witness to some um, tribe of people someplace in the world that have never heard, and you don't have to do it because you love them. You do it because you love Jesus. That's what an ambassador does. <clears throat> he loves his country, so he goes to another country to be the ambassador. He doesn't have to love those people. He's doing it because he loves his home country. You can do all kinds of things that you really don't want to do, but you do it because you love the Lord. What on earth are you doing? For heaven's sake, find something to do and say, God, what have you given me? I want to use this talent for your glory. Now, there are great rewards for those who are faithful. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6 and verse 1. I'm going to read these very quickly. <clears throat> What does God promise to those who are faithful? When you go to work for a company, or any, probably all of you, whenever you got your job, one of the questions was, how much do I get paid? I got my grandkids working for me around here, and they're all excited, and they're hard workers. Praise God for that. But one of the motives is, hey, Grandpa, how much are we going to get paid? Okay, well, here's what you get paid for doing this job. If you don't want to work, don't work. One of them, the younger ones, they work real hard, about 40 minutes, and then off playing someplace. Okay, well, I'll pay you for the 40 minutes. Eventually, they'll get the message. You know, there's a connection here. You work, you get money. You don't work, you don't get money. They slowly start to get that connection. I know some adults have still not gotten that connection. But Matthew 6, 1. Take heed that you do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, you have no reward of your Father, which is in heaven. You mean there's a way we can get it, not have a reward from the Father? Exactly right. My dad always kept three by five cards in his pocket, and each one of those cards had a different name on it. My name, my brother's, two brothers' name, my sister's name. He called that our account. And we would go work, and we would do, and he would write down on our account how much money we had. And we'd go up, hey, Dad, I need $10. Oh, let me see. Sure, I got it. And I'd, he'd give us $10 and mark it off of our account. Three by five cards in his pocket. Their old dad. So God, the Heavenly Father, is keeping records on each of his children, and he's going to pay us someday. How much do you have on your account? <clears throat> well, start putting some on there. It's not hard. Read your Bible. But why do you read the Bible? Well, because I have to. Okay, that's not a good reason. You're going to get a, a lump of a piece of wood, uh, and it's going to burn up judgment. I want, I want diamonds and gold and silver that God's going to give those kind of rewards that will endure the fire which is the teaching in, in Corinthians here. Matthew 10, 28 30, to 30. Peter began to say unto him, Lord, we've left all and followed thee. Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, there is no man that hath left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels, but he shall receive an hundredfold now in this time houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the world to come eternal life. Jesus promised him, his disciples, hey guys, 
You say you left all, and you did, I understand. You're going to get much more than that back. He promises rewards. Ephesians chapter 6, with good, verse 7, with good will, doing service as to the Lord and not unto men. You can tolerate a whole lot of stuff from the heathen down here and from the Christians down here if you realize I'm working for God. When people get offended and quit church because of what somebody said to them, apparently they're not doing what they're doing for the Lord. They're doing what they're doing to please their fellow man. And, of course, they're going to quit. And some pastors get so frustrated with their church people like because they <clears throat> they quit over the dumbest things. Well, they're not following the Lord. They're following the fellow man. You're better off without them. Let them go. Go get somebody else. Colossians chapter 3, verse 23. And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. See, uh, one of my favorite verses in the Bible, Psalms 119, which is the longest chapter in the Bible, right after the middle of the Bible. Psalm 118, 8 is the middle, I've been told. Psalm 119, 165. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Think about that carefully. If you get offended... You don't love the law. You don't love the Lord's book. You don't love the Bible. If you get offended, you don't love the Bible. That's what it says. You say, well, I'm offended. Okay, now we know you don't read or study or you don't, certainly don't believe or follow the Bible. Psalm 119, 165. Go chew on that one for a while. Colossians chapter 3, verse 24. Knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. Why are you serving God? I've been a Christian 46 and a half years. I have seen them come and go. I've seen people you thought, man, this guy's going to do something great for God, and then they, they, they're they gone, off into sin someplace. Why do you stay faithful to your wife or husband? Why do you study hard in school? Is it only because they're watching you? I know people, they're great workers as long as you're standing over them watching them. I don't need those kinds. I told people when they came worked it here at our ministry in Adonis Adventureland, I said, look, I am traveling, I am gone 220 days a year. I don't have time to babysit anybody. Here's your list. Get these 40 things done. I'll be back in a week. <laughs> That's all I can do. I have to have people that are dependable that I can just give them a list, and they're either done doing it or they're still working on it when I get back. Can God count on you? To, he doesn't have to watch you. How was it when you were a child with your parents? They said, go clean your room and do the dishes and do your homework. Did they have to come check on you every five minutes? If so, you don't understand how it's supposed to be. <clears throat> if you say, wow, I'm doing this for the Lord. And the eyes of the Lord are in every place. He's watching everything. Oh, well, then you can't get away from that. Once you get that in your head, I'm doing what I do to please Jesus. It changes everything. Now you can tolerate all kinds of stuff from your fellow man and fellow Christians and brothers and sisters. Why are you doing what you're doing? Well, you, you have to answer that one. But we're going to receive a reward. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 6. <clears throat> but without faith it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. That's where faith comes in. I believe God's going to reward you say, Brother Hoban, are you working just so you can get rewards? Well, yeah, pretty much. I, I used to go to work at General Motors just so they'd give me a paycheck. If they had stopped giving me that paycheck, I would have stopped going in and building them trucks. No doubt about it. I would have quit. <laughs> I wasn't there because I loved building trucks. I was there because I loved the paycheck. And God has promised a reward, a paycheck, for those who are faithful. And you should read about that paycheck. Let me try to get to there before we run out of time here. Uh, first, uh, Second John. Verse 8, John, 2 John only has one chapter. 2 John 8, Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. You mean it's possible to lose our rewards? Oh, yeah. Most companies, if you work someplace, they have a paycheck. But if you deliberately break something or do something wrong, they're going to deduct that out of your paycheck. You can lose your reward. Hmm, think about it. So, Revelation chapter 2 and 3 have seven different churches mentioned in there. Go to Revelation chapter 2, just uh, at the end of the Bible. Each one of these seven churches has some interesting promises. And there's a lot of parallels. You should line up these seven churches side by side. Get it, photocopy the page out of the Bible for chapter 2 and 3. 
cut out the church, tape it together into strips, and have church one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And see how and draw lines between the similarities and differences. They're amazing. Let me just read about the ones that overcome. In these in these seven churches, he said uh, in Revelation 2.11, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Hmm. Well, there's the reward. If you overcome, you won't be hurt of the second death. Verse 17, chapter 2, verse 17. He that overcometh, to him will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. You can get a prize if you overcome. Well, what if you don't overcome? Well, then you don't get the prize. And we'll see what that white stone is about later. Revelation 2.26 He that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him I will give power over the nations. You know, weren't they on TV the other night uh, trying to talk, talk us into voting for them to be a presidential candidate for the Republican Party? Why would anybody want... What is all this election stuff about? Well, they're trying to get power over the people. Hmm. God promised, if you'll overcome, I'll give you power over the nations. No election necessary. God's the only one voting on this. God's going to vote yes or no. Are you going to get power over the nations? Revelation 3, 5. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He promised, if you overcome, here's the prize. Revelation 3.12, he that overcometh, will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go, go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. That's God's promise. One of the things he'll give if you overcome. Revelation 3.21, to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am sat down with my father in his throne. How would you like to be called up in front of everybody? Hey, come on up here, sit down. Next to God himself. I don't think there's much better prize than that. I mean, if you went out to a fancy dinner and the president of the corporation called you up, hey, Jimmy, come on up here, come sit right here next to me. And everybody else, whoa, what did Jimmy do? He overcame. He was faithful. God's going to call you up and say, come sit with me in my throne. If you haven't read the book, The Shack, I know there are some theological issues there, and people always write to me, oh, you shouldn't recommend that book. because I've read it nine times. I don't read many books more than once, but that one I read nine times. Love it. Absolutely. And I'll read it again if I get time. The story about the Festival of Lights. If that doesn't make you cry, something is wrong uh, with your emotions, okay? Uh, Jesus taking time to spend time with everybody who wants to spend time with him. Just read that. That'll change your life. Revelation 3.21, he says, I'll let you sit in the throne with me. I want that. I want to go sit on his lap someday. Revelation 21, the very end of the book, verse 7, He that overcometh shall inherit all things. And I will be his God, and he shall be my son. I think for 46 and a half years of my Christian life, that's been one of my driving forces. I've had to put up with a few things. I go to prison for nine years for nothing. But you can just keep serving God. Joseph in the Bible went to prison for 13 years. Did nothing wrong at all. Read Genesis chapters in the 30s and early 40s. Joseph did nothing wrong. He's one of the few Bible characters that there is nothing bad said about Joseph. Daniel's another one. There are a few Bible characters where it doesn't tell a thing bad about him. Now, David was a great man, a man after God's own heart. But he did some bad stuff, and the Bible tells us. Abraham was a great man. He's called the friend of God. The only man in the Bible called the friend of God. God's friend. Wow. But Abraham did some dumb stuff, too. But Joseph, 13 years in prison, didn't do a thing. What if it happens to you? What if, during this time of tribulation... You get arrested and thrown in jail for three and a half years. What are you going to do? How are you going to react? Are you going to quit serving God and pout? We had one guy in the county jail with us in Santa Rosa County. claims he's a Christian. I haven't known him very well, but I knew him before. He won his appeal and got part of his sentence overturned. So he went to court to get his new sentence imposed, which he thought was going to be, hey, go home. 
And the judge, right here in Pensacola, said, okay, we're throwing out that charge, and your original sentence was five years. You're right. That charge is gone. I'm going to resentence you to five years. Give him the exact same sentence. After winning his case, he came back to the dorm in the same room I was in, cursing and swearing and saying, there is no God. I quit. This, this, this isn't, this isn't working. It doesn't work. Well, God's not a genie to give you what you want. This, all of this life is just a test to see what kind of rewards you get. Uh, are you going to quit when things go bad? Hmm. Maybe having brothers and sisters is a good test for that, to see if you can hang on during adversity. The Bible says a brother is born for adversity. I had two older brothers, and I can assure you they are born for adversity. <clears throat> so he said, if you overcome, I'll give you all things. You can inherit everything. What a promise for God of the universe to say, son, you overcame, come on up, sit in my throne, it's all yours. That's what he promises. You can inherit the earth. We'll cover that in a second if we get time here. So it's a paycheck he's going to give us. God's going to, God pays his people that work for him. <clears throat> Here's what the world does. <clears throat> the coach says, okay, Herman, we're going to hire you to be on our football. You're going to be the running back on our football team. We want you to take this stupid-shaped ball and want you to hold it under your arm. I want you to run from this line to that line down there at the end of the field, 100 yards away. If you'll do that as fast as you can, we will pay you $5 million a year. Wow. Now, here's the problem. There's going to be a bunch of other big guys over there that are going to be trying to stomp on you and kill you and break your legs and stop you any way they possibly can. So your job is to get from here to there while they try to oppose you. And if you'll do that, <coughs> we'll pay you $5 million a year. Isn't that why all the athletes do what they do? Now, suppose they said, we want you to take this stupid shaped ball and run from here to there, but there's nobody out there. What is the glory of running down a 100-yard field carrying a ball if there's no opposition? Well, you think the stands would be full of people paying whatever it costs to go see one of them games? Well, do you think they'd make millions of dollars for people to come stand and watch a guy run down the field? Nobody would come. Nobody. Because it's the opposition that makes it worth watching. Like, wow, did you see that play? Oh, man, them guys piled on top of him. <coughs> God is letting us do his work down here on this earth, and the opposition is what makes our rewards greater. You got the U.S. government after you? Oh, okay, well, then here's your rewards. What are you doing, and what is your opposition? If you have a job to do for God and you're experiencing great opposition, your husband, your wife is not supportive, okay, that's a time to get great rewards. I have heard that either John or Charles Wesley, I forget which one, <coughs> was out preaching, and every time that he would preach, this is back in the 1700s, his wife would sit in the audience and mock him and make faces at him and laugh at him, trying to discourage him, his own wife. Maybe the story's not true, or maybe I don't have the details right, but certainly that has happened to many folks. They decide, I'm going to serve God, and one of their close family members does not want them to do that. How about you? What's your opposition? Who's on that opposing team? They do that with boxing. Don't they try to match up guys that are kind of evenly matched? I mean, if they put out Michael Tyson against a 10-year-old, who would pay to go watch that? <coughs> we want a fair boxing match. God has pitted you against somebody. That's fair. He'll never give you more temptation, trials than you can handle. He promised he will not let you be tempted above that which you are able. First Corinthians talks about that. But he may push you right up to that limit. Any good coach does that, pushes his men right up to the limit. How much can they handle? You can run the mile. Okay, now you're done. Now do 50 push-ups. Now do, uh, I remember my coach in high school in tennis. Push-ups, push-ups, push-ups. Coach. We never do a push-up in the tennis match. Why are we doing a push-up? This is dumb. This is not part of the game of tennis. Oh, no, the push-up is not, but the same muscles you use to do the push-up, you use to smack that ball. That's why you do the push-ups. Now, get down and do some more push-ups. God knows what you need. He's putting you through things because he has a much bigger plan. And he promised, if you'll be faithful, I'll give you the rewards. The Olympics will, a guy, coach will say, you get up four in the morning, and you run 10 miles, and you until you nearly puke out your guts out your mouth, 
and then you do this every day and you eat all kinds of bad stuff that tastes bad but it's good for you and you avoid all the good tasting stuff because it's bad for you and if you'll do that for five years and train for the Olympics and if you win we're going to give you a medal that's worth five hundred dollars what <laughs> think about it why do they do that they don't do it for the five hundred dollar medal they do it for the glory everybody standing up clearing uh, cheering and clapping hey here's Jimmy he won the Olympics okay why do you do what you do for the Lord? God's going to give you a reward. Here's a couple of prizes he offers, and we'll quit here. Go to Psalms chapter 37, dead center in the Bible, Psalm chapter 37, one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. Psalm chapter 30, 35, 6, and 7 are just, I love them. Read them over and over again. But Psalm 37, there are <clears throat> seven references in this one psalm where he promises to give us the entire earth. You inherit the earth. Look at verse number 3. Psalm 37, 3. Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. God promises you'll dwell in the land and you'll be fed. Just trust in me. Look at verse number 9. Evildoers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. You know, we work really hard to save up money to buy a little chuck a property with a half acre or an acre or five acres wow you know god says man i'm going to give you the whole earth how many acres are on the whole earth let's see the surface area is uh four pi r squared so take the radius at the, the 30 uh 20 30 900 and i forget exact would we'll find there it's a little less than eight thousand miles as diameter take half of that square that and then take it times pi, 3.14159, then take that times uh, 4, and you got the surface area of the Earth in square miles. Now take that times 640, there's a whole bunch of land on this Earth. And of course, some's underwater. Now, probably won't be during the millennium. Anyway, Psalm 37, I'll just read them quickly here. we got to quit. Psalm 37, verse 3, 9, 11, 18, 22, 29, and 34. I'll talk about inheriting the whole Earth. That's a pretty good prize. Don't you think it'd be worth suffering for a short lifetime here, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, and inheriting the whole earth? I have said many times, I've never met her, but Johnny Erickson Todd is one of my heroes in life. She has suffered incredibly for 48 years, broke her neck, and barely moved her arms in a wheelchair. Johnny and Sons, or Johnny and Friends is her website. Uh, she wrote me the other day. Man, praise God. I didn't know if she knew anything about this. Thank you, Johnny. Appreciate that very much. I want to meet you someday. She has had to go through some horrible suffering, completely paralyzed, for 48 years. And she kept a good spirit. Maybe not all the time, but kept a good spirit. Hey, are you suffering? You in a bad marriage? You in a bad job? You don't like your boss? You don't like your landlord? You don't like whatever? What, how are you reacting to that? What's your reaction? Now, you may not be able to help what's happening to you, but you can help how you react to it. That's the thing. God promised a prize if we're faithful. There are so many verses in that. I recommend you get my book, of course, uh, What on Earth is About to Happen, where we have all this stuff in much more detail. But to me, I think Christians need to stop and look, and why am I doing this? Why am I doing what I'm doing? Why do I teach this Sunday school class? Why do I drive this bus? To I drove a church bus for 17 years. I started off brand new Christian, been saved a couple of months, 16 years old. My pastor said, Kent, I'd like you to teach the fifth grade boys Sunday school class. I said, I just, I'm a brand new Christian. I just got started. <clears throat> he said, I know. This will be the best thing ever to keep you straight. And man, did that, it was amazing. I don't know if the kids learned anything or not, but I sure studied the word. I said, God, i got to teach a class this Sunday. Man, Lord, help me learn this stuff. Help me study it. And I had a blast with those kids. We'd go camping and do all kinds of stuff. It was wonderful. For me, anyway, I thought it was great, and it was a great teaching tool. God may have given you some children. Maybe it's your own children. Maybe it's a Sunday school class. Maybe it's a ministry someplace. That's your training. He wants to see how you handle it. Are you doing it, are you doing it for him? If you're teaching your class to please people, you're not going to keep going. If you're driving that bus for 17 years just to please the people, it's not going to keep you going. You've got to say, Lord, I'm doing this for you. When I was traveling all over the world preaching on creation and evolution, I uh, flew 4.7 million miles just on Delta, plus all the other airlines. I said, Lord, why am I doing this? Lord, I love you. That's all. You want me to go? I'll go. Love you. And Lord, it's been 46 years. I still love the Lord. I still want to serve him. 
and there's still plenty of opposition and getting worse. <laughs> Why do you do what you do? Why don't you go examine your heart and say, Lord, what kind of rewards am I going to get? You're going to reward me, this judgment seat of Christ. Am I going to get wood, hay, and stubble? Am I doing this for the wrong reason? Man, I hope not. I hope not. We'll find out one day. I'll get to see why you did what you did. <laughs> and you'll all get to see why I did what I did. We're all going to get to see that. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Help us, Father, to do the, the right thing for the right reason. In Jesus' name, amen. See you next broadcast.